Good morning and afternoon and happy Friday everyone. Welcome to your weekly Fast Track Hangout. I'm Wayne Griffenberg, a CAD CAM application engineer at the Autodesk. Uh, with me today I have Matt Nichols who's in the background checking the questions as we go through and uh, our team will be jumping on as well to help answer some questions. So if you guys have any questions as we walk through today, please feel free to ask them in the questions panel in our GoToWebinar uh, chat. So today we're talking about our Haas Live Tooling, um, the basic overview. We've had a, a follow-up from a lot of our webinars where um, we've had uh, potential customers, uh, customers who, who have uh, Haas machines do a lot of milling and they're, they're interested in learning more about mill turning to be able to uh, add more productivity uh, to get some of that fourth axis as well uh, as the Live Tooling uh, on their machine. Uh, and see what it's about. So today we're going to give a quick overview or brief overview of what it means, what live tooling is, and uh, we're going to bring it apart in Fusion and how we can set up your parts in Fusion to do the turning as well as the milling operations using radial tools and axial tools and what that means and uh, how to do it. And then at the end we'll play a video. It's a, a Haas video apart uh, that matches what we have and uh, be able to show what it looks like in the ST machine uh, that has, uh, it's an ST20Y. So, as we go through, again, please feel free to ask any questions. Matt is, uh, is in, in, uh, on with us. Uh, he's, uh, he's got a lot, of, uh, in, in, a lot of experience working with the Haas turning machines, and we also have Al uh, on with us as well. And so please feel free to ask any questions. Again, this is going to be the basic overview. And uh, in the near future, we're going to have a lot more updates on what's going on with turning inside of Fusion. Okay, so let me get started. So this is what we're talking about, just an overview of what live tooling is in working with the Haas turning machines. And uh, we're going to give an example of a part in Fusion 360, how to set it up, uh, how to set up those tool paths inside of Fusion to be able to get the live tooling working as well as a video at the end to show you it running live. Well, to running it from a video. Okay, so in turning, we specify our axes in the machine along the center of the part. So different, the difference between milling and, uh, and turning is that when you have a vertical mill, uh, your Z is aiming up towards the tool, normal to that plane, uh, that you're looking down from the machine, and you have your X and your Y uh, laterally going into the machine and along the sides of the machine. In turning, we have the, the part itself is turning, is spinning around the z-axis, and we have a tool that comes in along the x-z plane uh, that starts to, to machine away the chips from the spinning part. Um, often those tools are static tools that are connected to a turret, but when we talk about live tooling, we're talking about tools that are actually rotating and moving to cut the chips on the, the turret itself. So to give you an idea, when we talk about spindles and turret, this, these are, uh, this is actually excerpts right from uh, the manual uh, from Haas, from the Haas machine itself. Um, so in the spindle, that's where we're going to have our part where it's held in the spindle and the part rotates around. And uh, in the turret, we have static tools as well as the um, live tools. And as you can see, number seven there, that's having a radial mount to, mounted tool, and number eight is an axial mounted tool. When we say axial, we're saying the tool, and we go on to the next slide, the axial tool is the center axis of the tool rotating is along the center axis of the uh, rotating part in our, in our, um, in our jaws. So it's along the center line of the lathe on the z-axis. When we talk about a radial tool, now we're talking about along the radius, uh, perpendicular to that center spinning axis, as you see on the right there. And that's the difference, the different types of tools that we work with when it comes to live tooling in the, in the Haas. So just to give you another idea of the planes and the work planes that we're working on, so as you're shifting through the different planes and you're selecting different geometry along the y-axis you'll hear about y-axis machining and that's where the tool in this case a radial tool will be moving uh, laterally along the G19 plane the the YZ plane and when we have uh, the the XZ plane in this case we have the um, the radial tool moving in and out along that G18 plane of the uh, of the workspace 
And then, of course, the G17 is on the face. So when you hear about face milling, we're talking about on that G17 plane. The part is moving, is rotating po uh, positively on the C-axis uh, going, if you're looking down at the part, going counterclockwise. Just to give you some more information about what to expect in the code when you're working with Haas Live Tooling, when you're switching from the turning mode into the milling mode, uh, just to give you an idea of some of those codes you would see, like a G98 versus your G99, uh, about the, the, uh, the feed per spindle revolution. Uh, we have our M133. When you see that code, we're turning on that live tool going forward. M134 is reversing that tool. Uh, M135 is, means you're going to put that tool away. You're going to stop that tool. Now you're moving back uh, either into another uh, tool or another um, milling operation, or you're going back into your turning mode. Uh, we also have the clamps on the machine. So we have an M14 and M15. M14 will clamp it, stop it in position like you're indexing to come in and do milling on that surface or if you're doing a face. Uh, and then it would unclamp to move to another position uh, to index or rotate where you can uh, you can do another operation. And just as a side note, Haas does a really good job of listing these G and N codes on their web page if you're ever interested. Yeah, I highly recommend re visiting their pages uh, or their web page, and you can see a lot of the manual information uh, that they have to help you get started working with uh, the mill turn machines. Thanks, Al. So this is uh, Orient the Spindle, the M19. Uh, so it's uh, given us some codes where we can reorient it to the angle that we're working with, with the, uh, the tool. Um, and your M119 secondary spindle, if you have like a DS, the dual spindle type lays, you can uh, see the M119 code where you reoriented that spindle as well. The M154 means your C axis is being engaged and M155 is disengaged. So again, as Al had mentioned, the website has a lot more information to help you learn more about those different codes and what the machine is doing. So for axial face milling, just to give you an exa example of a program of what to expect to see. So in this case, we're doing axial milling along the face of a part. And, uh, and this is the code you would see. You'd see that uh, the G18 with the, uh, the plane there, uh, the M133, which is turning the tool on forward, M154 engaging that C axis, which, uh, uh, which is uh, going to go C0 in this case. And then it's going to start to... Uh, machine and mill on the front face and you see that C90 as it rotates around the front face there. And then we disengage, uh, turn off the live tool and then move on to the next operation if you're going back into turning. So these are good examples just to give you a really simple basic idea of what it means to have a live tool turned on in the lathe. So another example just to show you um, the axial face milling going through the part you see the C-axis rotation there going C215 and then stopping the code. So as we switch into the G112 mode from XY to XC, it's interpolating. It's actually converting those coordinates. So it's a polar coordinate conversion. So the code switches that Cartesian plane to the polar coordinate so that you're not always running the X, Y, and then having to go into the C uh, to rotate the part. It translates that plane so that as you're working on that face or you're working on that uh, or radial edge or, or axial face, it's going to convert that geometry. It's going to convert the plane uh, for the X, Y, so you're always working linear, and then it'll convert the C axis rotary. Okay, so it's a conversion. The G112 is an XY to XC interpolation conversion. We'll talk a little bit, little bit of that, about that more. So radial or cross milling. So now we're going along the radius uh, of the part or, or perpendicular to that plane that we initially set up on the front. So if we're doing this um, uh, radial cross milling, now we're going to drill along the, the uh, radial surfaces of the part in this case. Um, it'll, this will show you that index around the part. So you have that M154, our G19 plane, then our M154, uh, it engages at that C0, and it starts the process, turns on the tool, the M133, you turn on your coolant, and then you start your, your, uh, your C0, and then it starts the drill operation. 
And then we have a C rotation, C180, goes to the other side and drills that hole. And then it brings us around C270 to drill the, the, the final hole. We have our M135 and then our M155 to put that tool away. So these are some basic examples of what to expect to see in the code when you're setting up your tools for radial and, or cross milling. So when we talk about a y-axis, the y-axis, and this just gives you an overview of that compound motion of what's happening in the horizontal plane versus the x-plane and the y-plane. And this is the way you'd see it set up in the machine. The x moving back and forth along that, the, uh, the, the perpendicular to, of course, the y, the turret moving up and down, and the z moving in towards the part, and then your c-axis uh, positive and negative in the machine. Okay, here's another good example of, uh, of, of doing some uh, tool paths that we normally do. We would do a face tool path uh, in a case like this where you can keep the tool normal to that perpendicular axis. This gives you, or axis, this gives you the a basic code or basic program for doing something like that. So it's a pretty good example. All right, so this is an example of a dual spindle machine. So the DS, the Haas DF test machine, you'll see it has a spindle in the front, what we call that one where it says C1 there. And we have another spindle uh, towards the back of the machine or to the right. And, uh, and this is where we can do the part handoff and be able to work on the other side of the part. It just adds more flexibility. So one of the main things about having a type of machine where you can do lathe turning as well as milling is reducing those setups, especially when you have cylindrical type parts, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. In places where you're working on the front side of your part, getting those, those features that you're looking for, whether they're axial cuts, uh, if you're doing like a hex, you're doing face uh, milling, things like this. And if you're doing radial cuts where you're putting holes along the side or features or pockets along the side of the part, or the, along the cylindrical side of the part, you can also hand off to another spindle to get the rear side of the part. So you can add features on the other side. So it's really reducing the number of setups you would need, speeding up your process of being able to get the parts off the machine a lot quicker. And so those are some of the advantages of having these types of machines, uh, depending on the type of geometry you're cutting uh, and also the type of uh, operations that you're looking for. I highly recommend going to check out Haas's tip of the day or even go into Haas's YouTube uh, uh, site, their, their channel. Um, they do a great job of getting a lot of information to you. This is one uh, where they had um, walked through the process of setting up those live, live tools properly. Uh, if you're new and you're setting up your machine, this is a, a must-see uh, set of videos to go out and check out. Uh, how to set up those tools on your turret uh, for axial and radial tools, as well as general information about the machine. And it also leads to other videos to help you and guide you on, on setting up your parts in the machine to get them cut um, most efficiently. Um, another place, uh, absolutely visit our forums. Go to our Fusion 360 CAM forum. Uh, to, to find out from our experts and our elite users who are in there every day answering questions, uh, helping people get started. Uh, definitely go to our forums. If this is a place where you have questions, uh, absolutely uh, get, get started here. So you can reach our, our main CAM forum. We also have a post processor forum. So if you're looking for a particular post or help with your post, you can find that information right on our Autodesk forums. Some other great resources. Um, if you don't know Lars Christensen, uh, I highly recommend looking him up. Find his videos. He's got a lot of videos in his YouTube channel, as well as Instagram. He does Lars Live, and he does a lot of walkthroughs and uh, how to get started and, and quick tips on how to work with mill turn, as well as milling and turning. Uh, Lars does a great job of explaining uh, how these processes work. So I highly recommend checking out Lars, check out his Lars, uh, Lars Live, and check out his YouTube channel. This year, if you haven't been to Autodesk University, I highly recommend registering and attend 
at Autodesk University, we do have our, our schedule of classes that are up. Um, I know there's a lot of CAM classes that you can join. And if you register, there's, there's absolutely classes that you can learn more about milling, uh, mill turn, live tooling. Uh, we do work with Haas. We're going to have live classes there as well as our keynotes, uh, speakers. You can meet some of the elite uh, team, the elite users and power users that we have out there in Fusion uh, and working with Haas and working with other uh, machine tool dealers. Uh, but it's going to be a highly or, or really CAM focused this year. So join us in, uh, in uh, at Autodesk University. Uh, if you haven't been there before, I, I really recommend uh, joining us. It's a great time. Okay, um, so those are some of the uh, overview information I wanted to get out for you guys. I just wanted to walk through what those basics were uh, for what we, when we say live tooling, what does that mean? Um, when we're setting up turning machines uh, or, or mill turn machines for those operations, uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background. So now what I'd like to do is I'm going to bring up a part um, that matches one of the parts that uh, we see that was being machined uh, in one of the demos from uh, the ST machine. So it's a basic part, but I'm going to walk through what you would do in cases to be able to set up a part like this to get your live tool uh, working. When you're designing a part, if you have the option and you're designing it, whether it's in Fusion or you're opening up a part and making some changes, doing some live edits, it's a good idea to try to save a simplified version of your part along the way. In this case, I have a model of my initial stock drawn up and just revolved. I have a model of, of simplified features on here. Um, it's a good idea to try to keep it simplified when you're doing just basic turning operations, if you can. Uh, and you can also uh, keep another set of operations for the, the, the next uh, group of, of, uh, of turning, or should I say milling operations that you're going to do. And the more, complica more complex the part gets, the, the, uh, the, the harder it is to can keep those tool paths under control that you're trying to work with. So the easier you can keep it for yourself, the better. So I like to make simplified models. This is going to be for my two uh, axis turning operations. And I'll turn this one on later to do a lot of the milling operations while I'm in this interface. So you could do your setup when you're in CAM uh, for milling, for mill turn, or turning. And so you can separate those by different operations. You can also work within one operation, uh, rotate the part, or if you're going to hand off the part, you can do that as well. But as you're doing that, you can always turn on different versions of your model, simplified to more complex versions of, excuse me, versions of your model. Okay, so I'm going to jump into the CAM side. I want to keep this as a simplified version. I'm going to go into CAM. And I'm going to set this part up as if I'm going to uh, do some uh, turning first and then later on come back and show you how to set up to do the milling operations on there. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is I'm going to go into a setup and I want to set it up the way it is in the machine. So I'm going to go up to setup and I have this, this interface. It, it, the interface comes up for me as if I'm doing milling operation. Whether you're doing milling, mill turn, or you're doing cutting, if you're working with your water jet, laser, or plasma, it's always the same workflow when it comes to CAM. So it's just a matter of choosing which of those operations you're working with or what type of machining operations you're doing now. So I'm going to switch over to turning and mill turn, and it switches this interface here where I can choose whether I'm working on a primary or secondary spindle, uh, if I want to work from the radius out. Um, and I'm going to go and set this up where my rotary axis right now is sort of open because I drew it around the Z and the X plane. Um, it, and that's where my profile is. That's where my zero is. It recognizes that off the model. Now, sometimes you won't always have that option and you have to select what your center radius is or your, your Z axis radius is. You can select that right off the model or you can select it right off your origin. So if you turn on your origin, uh, it's kind of hidden behind my my X, Y, and Z here, but you can always select that Z axis right there, and I'll select that to be your Z axis of ro ro rotation. If, I, if you don't have that available, you can always select a cylindrical feature off your model, and that becomes your center axis of rotation. So I selected this cylinder right here, uh, and again, it puts it in the orientation where I have my X and Z, and sometimes your, your X may be on the other side of the part. You can in simply flip the z-axis, or you could choose geometry off the model that represents that x-axis as well. 
Okay, and in my stock, I can set up the relative size box or I can set up a fixed size cylinder. Uh, in this case, I actually drew up what the stock would look like, what the stock is. So I'm going to go down and choose from solid. And this is helpful if you have a part that was uh, made from a casting or if it was made from a forging. Uh, you can always bring in that model into Fusion and you can choose that model as your initial stock to start with. I'm going to expand this down. And out of my bodies, I'm going to choose initial stock. And now it recognizes that initial stock part as being my stock that I'm going to use going forward. Okay. And I'm going to go to, uh, I'm going to say, okay, I think I'm all set up here. Um, keep in mind, since I'm using a simplified version of the part, I don't need to make a spun profile. But if you do have any features that cross that XZ plane, it's a good idea to make a spun profile. This way it keeps... I'm going to hover over. This way it keeps that, that maximum profile as if it revolves it around. And in the background, it makes that as a, as a sketch that uh, it will be used later on for operations. But in this case, um, I, I wanted to keep all the simplified uh, 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 features of my model into one simplified version up here. And it's easier to do it this way than to try to, to hide or make, uh, make a spun model that doesn't include those features that I'm milling later. Okay, I'm gonna say okay. So I have my stock set up. I'm oriented the way it's gonna be sitting in the machine right here. So now I'm ready to do the basic two axis uh, turning tool pass. So I'm gonna go up to turning. I'll start off with a turning face. Okay, what I love about our cam, it's always the same workflow working from left to right. Now, if you guys have seen us work on, on Fridays in milling, uh, you'll see the same workflow going from left to right, select our tool geometry, our heights, in this, in this case, radii, because when you're turning, you're working from the center out, our passes and our linking, exactly the same workflow. So I'm gonna select the tool out of the tool library. Today, I'm working on the Haas ST, so I have a library of tools that we have in our, our Haas STOI machine. STOY, ST20Y machine, and then I'm going to select uh, um, a, a roughing tool, a general tool out of the library. And of course, you can always go in here and make edits to that tool that you would need, uh, your speeds and feeds, your setup, your insert, standard insert information, uh, holders, your setup, your orientation. This is an important piece, especially when you're working with live tooling. Now, I'm not going to reorient this part, this tool, but if this is going to be, right now it's set up as a radial tool off the turret. If this is going to be an axial tool, I would make this 90 degrees. Now, right now, it's this, this tool wouldn't make sense for me to do that, but I just want to show you this is where you would orient it the way it matches the tool set up in your turret. So keep that in mind. So if you have an axial tool, you want that to be 90 degrees in the tool library. Okay, I'm going to say OK. I'm not going to make too many any changes in there. I'm going to select it, and it does the face tool path automatically. I'm going to say OK. I get the face tool path. I can simulate. Uh, I'm going to go and do the profile real quick, and we're going to come back and do a simulation real quick. So I'm going to do a profile. So I'm going to go up to my turning, turning profile. We're going to use the same tool. I'll move this over here a little bit. It's a little bit easier to see. So I'm going to use the same tool that we selected for the face operation. Uh, for my geometry, I can confine the toolpath if I want to keep it in one specific area. I can select faces or edges off the, off the uh, part like this. I could select this face and this edge. It'll confine the toolpath in that area. In this case, I don't really want to do that, so I'm going to say OK. But I just want to let you know that's what it will do. Okay, I'm going to leave this the way it is. I'm going to say OK. And now I have this roughing profile working its way into the part. Okay, so I'm going to go and uh, I'm going to simulate those. I'm going to do a quick setup or simulate. I'm going to grab setup to grab all the tool paths underneath. So I'm going to simulate those. You play through. And here we're doing the, uh, the rough profile of the part. So if you guys are working with milling and you're new to turning, um, it's, it's, this should be also the same exact process that you're used to seeing on the milling side. And if you're new to turning, it's good to see, good to know that you're able to, uh, 
to get a good representation of what the part's going to look like at the end of that toolpath. Can we share a quick little trick on this one and maybe uh, show the no drag option just uh, for people that might not have seen it? The no drag option now? Yeah, so, so no drag. Um, what, you, what you might be seeing when it's turning here is that the tool sort of takes a nice shallow cut as it's going along the diameter and then when it hits the vertical wall it, it drags up that wall and it's not very good on the insert. So there's a, a neat little option in the toolpath where you can turn on no drag. I think it might be nice to just show users. That's a good point, Al. So I'm going to go in and edit. And in the toolpath setup, I think we're in the passes, right? This right here. Uh, so, so again, if you're new to HSM, uh, anything that controls the cutting motion is found on the Passes tab. So that's it's how you know where to go find it. Exactly. And that also makes it so much easier to use because you always know where to go find your operations. So what Al's talking about is here, no dragging this option. You can turn it on. And now you can set your limits, your clearance, and your overlap. So you can turn on and enable no dragging. I say, okay, I'm going to leave them the way they are for now. And now we have the option for without seeing a drag. I think I, so I see Sean here saying it's a machinist lifestyle. And I, I believe he's referring to the fact that uh, everything has a place and everything's in its place. Uh, that's the way we organize our toolboxes. And while the software should be organized well, too. Absolutely. That's a great point. So we've already seen it do the face. We'll go over here and we'll go and we'll show it again. We can fast forward through a little bit. But, but turning on that option for no dragging is a nice option to be able to put on. Okay, so I want to finish up that uh, those, uh, those faces right there. So I'm going to go up and do a finish operation. Before I do, I'm going to soft click on profile because these are the names that are going to uh, end up posting out of my code. So I'm, I would like to change the name so I know that this is going to do the rough so I can find it easily in the code. And now I'm going to go and add a, a finish. Now I can uh, start a new toolpath or I can right click on rough, go down to copy, right click on setup, go down to paste, and I can easily make a duplicate of the same toolpath. In this case, it's not really much of a big deal because it's just looking at the profile, but I wanted to show you that you can do that really quickly. So I'm going to call this one finish. I'm going to edit that toolpath. I'm going to change the tool. Again, working from left to right, select the tool. I'm going to get the finish tool out of my ST. I'll use this one. And I want to make sure that I am in passes, not leaving any stock and turning off any roughing passes. And I can also edit and update the finish feed rate if I wanted to here. Okay, we also have that no dragging option turned on in the toolpath here. And now we have this finished toolpath. So I want to come in and groove. Uh, this is going to be a thread here. Um, actually, I'm not going to do the whole part because I want to get to the the, third, the uh, milling part on this one, but I just want to give you a, a quick overview of some of the toolpaths we're doing here. So I'll do a little bit of a groove in here. So I want to groove that area out. So I'm going to go into my turning grooving toolpath. Again, working from left to right, going to select the tool. I believe I have a groove in my ST20 there. Select that tool. I can see what it's going to look like in the graphics view here. Okay, and I'm going to select the geometry. Now, that grooving tool is going to go everywhere it can, wherever it sees an area where it can groove down in. And this is pretty simplified, but in this case, I want to keep that tool in this area right here. So I can choose the edges or the faces, and I want to make sure that the groove tool is staying in, in those faces right there so I can groove that little area out. Okay, so for my radii, I'll leave them the way they are from the inside out. Clearance looks good. And in here, I have some options, whether I want to do up, down, if I want to do a full step down or do a partial sideways step down so we're able to move back and forth in that little groove there. I'll leave it as a full step down. Um, here, I'm going to choose only down. If I'm going to finish up around here, I don't want it to hit the back of the tool going up along the wall. So I want to make sure that as it reaches those walls that it's only going down along the wall. Okay, so the step over is this information. I'm going to leave the way it is. 
I'm going to say OK. And now we have it grooving that little area out there. So let's simulate what we did so far. So I'm going to highlight setup. I'm going to go to uh, simulate. Now we've already seen it do the face, the rough. We can watch it do the finish. And all I'm doing is selecting them out of the browser here to choose which one we want to start with. You can also right click and you can say next operation or previous operation. In this case, I'm going to go to play. It'll play through. And now we'll be able to see it do that groove operation right here. Comes in with the groove tool and grooves out that little area, that real relief for our thread. Okay, so the next thing I would do is I would thread this. Let's go and get a quick threading tool real quick. So I'm going to go to turning thread. I'm going to select the thread tool out of my library. I think I have one here in the ST. So I would go through and select the geometry. I want to make sure I thread this geometry here. I can also tell it if I want some offset on the stock there, front side and back side. For my passes, I could set up my thread pitch. I could change the number of step downs that we need to make sure that we get a good thread on there. I'm going to leave them the way they are. Let me get a thread toolpath on there. Okay, so we're pretty much done with the front of the part, or at least not the front, but I have some other features in here that I want to show you how to set up for live tooling. So I'm going to go into an, an, uh, the more complicated version of the part. If I go and turn on this one where I have these flats as well as these um, slots in here. Now, I made them sort of like a ball mill here because I want to show you that we can go axially and we can also come to the side of the part. But the good way to do it is to use a slot mill and be able to ride up and roll that slot mill right out of there. But I'd like to show you, um, I'm going to set up and use a ball mill to go right along the top of there and then cut that out. I'm going to use a trace tool path to do it. So I'm going to go and start a milling operation. So if I go up to 2D, I don't have to switch out of this environment. I don't have to create a new setup to do milling. I'm doing it right in the same setup right here. So I'm going to go to 2D, trace. Okay. So a trace operation is really nice because it follows a contour that I select. And I think I did it in this view. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to go into my geometry. Okay. And it's going to ask me what plane do I want to work on. Now I want to check my sketches real quick because I'm going to use that sweep right there to define the way the tool is going to approach the part. Now, of course, you can always select geometry right off the part. Um, but what I want to do is first, before I do that, I want to tell it that I'm going to orient around to the X. I want to orient this part in position where it's going to be normal to that axial tool to come in and then ma machine that out. So I want to choose the plane first. The way I do that is by turning on tool orientation in the geometry tab. So now I can orient it to any geometry. So it'll be normal. The z-axis can be normal since I'm, I'm selecting z. It can be normal to any face that I select as well as any plane. So I'm going to make that tool normal to this plane. Okay, there's my, it's my um, xy plane there. Or I think it's my xz in this case. So I'm going to select that plane. Now I have that work plane selected. And now what I want to do is select my geometry. So what do I want to cut along that plane? So if I go up into geometry to my curve selections, of course I can select anything off the, off the part here that's normal to that Z, or I can roll it around. In this case, it's kind of hard to select the bottom of that slot pocket right there. I can, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to use geometry I already uh, set up earlier to make that slot. So down here I have a sweep um, sketch that's going to that's sweep that slot in there. So that's going to actually be the path that I want the tool to go. So it's really easy to be able to select geometry that you created out of sketch geometry you've made before. And that's right Maybe down the center there. Maybe we there for a moment, too, because I think it's a very, very important distinction. One of the, the big values to having a design and CAM together is, is truly when you're designing, you're thinking about how something's manufactured. A lot of the times what drives your design is what's going to be the process for manufacturing this. And as such, the way these slots were modeled properly, we're thinking about how a tool would cut it. And so it's very commonly the case that the underlying geometry for a feature is actually the geometry you would use for something like this. So uh, it's, a, it's a good trick, and I'm glad that you, I'm glad you brought, 
drew attention to that because we often forget about it uh, when we're doing our programming, but the truth is that the engineer had to model it to be machinable. That's exactly right. And it's helpful when, when you have the ability to model the part uh, that you're going to be making. And you know, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it gives you much more of an advantage to be able to use those features to drive your tool paths. But it's often that we don't. We're not the ones making the part. We're the ones getting the part that has to uh, machine it. And so sometimes we don't have those, those uh, capabilities. We're not able to use that geometry. Sometimes we have to create it in the model to be able to use it. But there's also other ways that you can use this geometry in different types of tool paths to keep the tool engaged exactly as you want it. This is just one option and one way to do it if you have those features available. So I selected that chain. And this being a trace toolpath, it's going to follow where I select that chain. If I go into the passes, I have a chance now, if I did select an edge off the model, I can also choose whether I want to have compensation to the left or to the right of that line that I selected. In this case, I'm going to leave it right down the center. I can also offset it axially if I wanted to control uh, the height of where that toolpath, where that tool is going to go into that slot. So I have some options in here in the trace tool path to do that. I'm going to say OK. What's important though, oh, <laughs> I didn't choose a tool. So that's OK. I'm going to go down to my Haas ST. And that's a great thing about the our cam. It's like, hey, you didn't choose a tool. You forgot a step. And then it reminds us, go back, hey, you got to choose a tool before you can cut this. Oh, you're right. I do. And so I think I'm going to filter a little bit more down here because I have a couple ball nose and bull nose mills in that library. So I'm going to select OK. I'm going to grab this eighth inch ball out of the library. That's going to be on the uh, radial uh, setup on my turret. So I have a radial tool that's a ball mill on the turret that's going to come in and do that, that, uh, that feature right there. Okay, so I can see a preview of it. If I want to go and uh, get a quick view of what that setup's going to look like, I'm going to, hide, I'm going to highlight setup simulate and I can go all the way down to where it does the trace right there okay and as it catches up with me here here it goes there we go and now I can show what that's going to look like I can also turn off the previous tool pass to get a view and now if I play through now it's going the other way so I'd like to reverse that the other way it looks like it's not showing one of my models. Another little trick, though, that you did very quickly, but I think it's important to draw attention to. I think you did a video on it, actually, Wayne. Um, but did everybody notice how he used the uh, the cam browser to jump to the trace operation? There was a delay for the simulation to catch up, um, but I think it's often missed that you can you can jump directly to a toolpath in the simulation by selecting it in the browser there. So. All these things you do intuitively, Wayne, that maybe not everybody is aware of. No, that's a good point now. Thank you. And sometimes that's the thing. You know, it's one thing I like uh, a lot about when we do these webinars and we have guests that come in to talk with us, uh, especially our elite users like Seth and, and Lawrence and Rob Lockwood and, and you guys who are in the audience who work with our cam all the time and you work with your machines and you come up with quick uh, ways to to uh, to get to your tool pass and be able to make things work really well and for some of us it's not an everyday thing uh, but to you it might be something that you do all the time and for for a lot of us just to see you do that is like wow that's so cool I never thought you can do that and things like Al was pointing out is something I do all the time but it's I know there may be a lot of users as Al had mentioned who don't know that you can do that you can jump from different tool paths right in the browser so these little tips that, that you guys do every day are worth a lot to, to us who are uh, working uh, on, uh, on bettering ourselves and getting better with uh, machining and, and uh, CAM. So uh, what I want to show what's important about that is I was able to get that trace to work in that plane. I think I might want to flip my Y around so it goes the other way. In fact, I want to flip this geometry so it goes the other way. Um, but I can easily do that here. If I go into the trace and where I select that line, I can always choose the other direction on there. But what I want to show you is if I go and I post out the code, I want to show you what it looks like when it sets up that live tooling operation versus the turning operation. So I'm going to go into setup six. I'm going to grab all those tool paths. 
I don't really have to actually. Let's say we did a groove. Uh, let's do the rough. And I'm going to hold control. And I'm going to grab the trace toolpath. I've only grabbed two toolpaths. I don't recommend doing this, especially if you're going to run it on the machine, but only because I'm doing this for an example of showing you the differences between two operations. I can select the face operation, Wayne, so it's less code. Yeah, good point. The face operation and the trace. So I'm grabbing a turning operation and a live tooling operation, and I'm going to post them out. So I'm going to go to post process and I want to post it on my um, ST20Y. So if I go and select the post, so if I go into my generic post and I'm going to take a look and I don't know if I do have a Haas ST20Y in here. And if I don't, that's okay because I can get one really quick. So I don't see an, uh, on my, I don't see a Haas ST20Y. So I'm going to go and search on the post on the post online library. I'm going to filter down on Milturn posts, and look, there's a Haas ST20, ST30, there's a Haas ST20Y, it was updated shortly ago, and I'm going to get that latest one so I can use it right now. So I'm going to click download, looks like I did this earlier, so I'm going to open up that folder where I downloaded it to. So there's the Haas ST20Y post, and I want to be able to use it. So if I go into here, I can find that folder pretty quickly. But if I go to setup, I want to use my personal post, right? Because I'm going to put it in my personal post folder so that if I do have to make any edits to it or if I make any changes or if I want just to keep it separate, I can always go to my personal post and have a group of posts that I know are the ones that I, I work with all the time. And I can always jump to this folder. So while I'm here, I could just say open that folder. It looks like it grabbed the wrong folder. Oh, I didn't go to the right folder there. So if I go to Setup, I can say Open the Folder, right? And here's my personal post right here. So I can take that Haas ST20Y post that I just downloaded, which is in my Downloads folder, and I can put it right into here. Now I have that Haas ST20Y in my personal post folder. Okay, so I'm going to cancel because I want it to reload. And now if I go up to post process, if I look in my personal post folder, now I have a Haas ST20Y. So you can really quickly, if you don't see it in the list, you can go to our online library and you can find posts there that you can work with. So I'm going to select the Haas ST20Y. I'm going to post out. I'll overwrite that 1001 that I do every week. And now I have the code for the face operation. Now, if I look down here, you'll see that I have now the M154. It's turning on that um, axial tool. In this case, yeah, the axial tool. It's going to the G19 plane on the top there. I get the M15, which is turning off the lock. It'll rotate. In this case, I don't have any rotation, but when I do them later, you'll see rotation and locks it. And then it starts to come in to do the XZ move of the tool. So now I'm, I'm milling, I'm, I'm machining that, on, on, I'm milling it, and then when it's done, it turns off that tool, the live tool, and brings me back into the mode where I can start doing more turning or another live tool operation. So I want to show you that the post that we have when you post out for the ST20Y will recognize, even in the same setup, that you're now switching on an axial tool, or in this case, a radial tool. Now, if I wanted to be able to make those same things, I can copy it, rotate it, copy it, rotate it. Um, in this case, what I would make it my life easier is I want to do a pattern of those same features around the part. So as I have this one highlighted, I'm going to go up to Pattern. I'm going to select a circular pattern. Okay, my axis, I can choose any face on here. And if I had an axis open, I can choose that as well. But I'm going to go around this axis. It's going to give me two, and it's going to equally go around the angle 360, so it's going to go on the opposite side of the part. So it'll actually rotate around 180 and then do that one. But I, I have 24 of them, so I'm just going to plug in here 24. And now it's going to rotate around 15 degrees each to do those 24 slots. I have to give a kudos to Curtis, too. Curtis... Uh... Uh, not our Curtis, a, a user Curtis, 10 minutes ago said, I see a pattern coming. <laughs> awesome. 
Awesome. Yeah. So it makes your life a lot easier to be able to do patterns. And, and, and uh, the greatest thing I, I love about it is that, you know, it recognizes the pattern, but it knows exactly what to do in the post. So I'm going to say, OK, now let's post out that pattern real quick. So I'm going to go up to post process, going to use my ST20Y, post out, save the code. Yep. I'm going to overwrite what I did before. And then when I look at this, I can see it's doing that machining at C0. But as you go into the next operation, it's going C15. So I have my unlock, rotate C15, like I'm indexing, locks it, and now does the, the same code, does the same path. Rotates around, unlocks it, rotates it around 30 degrees. So I'm going 15 degrees around the part, but it automatically recognized that from the pattern and knows exactly how I want to rotate around the part to do that same slot all the way around. Really quick, really easy to be able to get a pattern and get your toolpath. You can always go back underneath, find that trace, make any changes you need to make to it, edit it, and now you're good to go. Okay, so that's that's all I wanted to show on this front of the part. Let me see the time real quick. We're looking good. And if you end up with time at the end, I think I teased last week that I'd show some updates that are coming to turning. So if you end up with some time at the end, I'll, I'll give a sneak peek of what's coming. Oh, that would be awesome. That'd be great, Al. Thanks. So at this point, now I don't have, I'm using the ST20. I don't have a DS machine with me, or on me, if you will. Uh, but the DS, you can take it from one side. Uh, the, the other um, spindle will come up, or the other uh, chuck jaws will come up. Uh, you, can, uh, you can set it up that it grabs the part, moves it over, and then you can cut the back side of the part. In this case, I would pull it out of this setup, rotate the part around, and put it back into another setup. So that's this, I'm going to call this one op one. And now I'm going to do op two on the other side of the part. So am I going to my setup? And now I'm going to go Z axis is going to be the opposite. And if I didn't select anything to be the Z axis, of course I can select, you know, off of the part itself. And if I go back up to the stock, I had initially set up a stock um, last week we showed you the ability to get an STL file from the first operation out of simulation and bring it back in and you can use that as your stock for the second operation. Uh, in this case I'm going to keep it simple. I'm just going to grab that same stock body we did last week or the one we did earlier. But I did leave some stock on the back. Uh, of course I would, I would do a parting operation. I kind of skipped that part but I would do a parting operation. I'll be able to flip it over and I'm going to do this back part but that's what I have left from the parting operation. Okay, and now I want to be able to mill this face off with a radial tool. So I'm going to go into, um, uh, I'm going to, actually going to change this to op2. Okay, there's my operation two. So I'm going to do a face on the top of this part here. So I'm going to go up to my 2D face operation. See the tool is oriented to be an axial tool. So I want that to be a radial tool to get to see the top face of this part because everything's projected along the Z. So if I go, I, I need to interrupt you here just for a second, just in case this is the first time somebody's watching this video. Anytime you see your tool coming in the wrong direction, uh, you need to decide: is it coming in a different direction because the machine can move or mount the tool differently, or is my setup in the different direction? I, I bring that up because it's very common that we see users. I uh, use tool orientation to correct a setup, but if you're using a three-axis machine and Z is in the wrong way, you want to make sure you go back to your setup and make sure that, that Z is pointed in the right direction. Hopefully it's a, it's a little tip or an aside, but it's just a bonus for anybody that might be uh, here for the first time or watching the video for the first time. Absolutely. Good point. If, if you think generally and you think you have a setup, you're going to do an initial setup like that setup we did, the way the part's sitting in the machine, that's the way you want to orient it in your setup. And as Al had mentioned, if you have a multi-axis machine that can rotate the part, that's when you 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 don't want to do it in the setup. You want to use tool orientation because that's the place where you're going to get the code to rotate a part or reorient the part. So it's a, it's a very important distinction to know that we're not going to use this tool orientation to change the way the part's sitting in the machine itself. We're going to use it to reorient the part according to the tool. So it's an important distinction to make. So in this case, I do want to use tool orientation because I'm going to use 
a radial tool that's in the turret of the machine. The part is going to stay rotating around that center Z axis. I don't want to change that. But I, what I want to do is I want to change the axis that the tool is going to approach the part on. So in that case, I'm going to change this Z axis so that the tool is facing the right surface of the part, like that. So now the tool is going to come down. It's going to rotate in position if it has to. And now my tool is now going to approach the normal to the Z of that face. Okay, so now I'm going to select the geometry. Now, in this case, I'm doing a facing operation or a face operation. I don't want to face the whole stock piece. I just want to face that area right there. So I can select that as my geometry. Oops, sorry, guys. Select that as my geometry. And now that becomes my stock contour of where it's going to recognize the face tool to go. Now, of course, I skipped this step. I want to go back and select the correct tool. So if I go to my Haas ST20, I have a couple face mills. I'll grab this face mill right here. And I want to go into the Passes tab because I want to add some extension. And I also want it to go back and forth along this axis. So I'm going to say I'm going to make this 90 degrees. And I want to extend it past an inch. Okay, I'm going to say OK. And now I have a face for that edge, for that face of the part, going at 90 degrees. Now, since this is a round part, my... My uh, inserts are going to hit probably pretty hard, so I want to step down to that face, right? So if I go into here and I do my simulation real quick, and if I play, you'll see, look at all that material. That's going to rip my inserts right out. So, but that's a good thing about being able to come in here and do a simulation. You can see really quick that you're taking really big bites out of your material there. So I want to go back into that face tool path, edit it, and I'm going to do multiple depths. And let's say we go at uh, 50 thousandths a step. And now we're working into the material at 50 thousandths a step. So I like this. I'm going to take a look real quick at that option. I'm going to go into simulate real quick. And I can see you know, now we're taking a more moderate step into the material. I feel better about what that's going to do. So I really recommend doing your uh, simulation after you set up any toolpath. Okay, so now I want to get that on the other side. I can easily make a pattern of this. So we've seen it do the patterns. And I'm going to do a, a circular pattern. And I'm going to do just two is fine, but I'm going to choose the axis where I want to rotate around. I can choose a side of this part or a cylinder, and it knows to flip it to the other side of the part. So that quick, I can get these flats on both sides. Right? And we can also go in and look at the code real quick. I'm going to post to the same post. My new setup, my new orientation, my new G54, my G154. And now I have it doing that face operation, multiple step downs. C0, and now it's going to rotate around C180, lock it, and now it's going to machine that face. Okay, so I didn't plan to come in and, and do the whole part, but I think uh, if you guys have this down, if you have a good idea that using our tool orientation is a really um, effective way, or it is the way, to be able to get the tool, whether it's a radial tool or an axial tool, um, to orient in the direction you want the tool to go. So if we did something like this and I want to drill these holes or machine this contour, I can simply do a 2D contour or a 3D adaptive or 2D adaptive to work my way into that hole there and, of course, rotate around and be able to do a bore or a circular drill at first and then do a circular to bore those out. But those are the ideas that I just want to show you and walk through the steps you would do, uh, to, you would take to be able to get your live tools set up in using Fusion 360. Okay, so Wayne, Seth had an excellent idea in the comments. I think I'm going to take him up on his idea. Why don't you go ahead and, and close out the webinar and do what you need to do to pu publish the video for the next minute or two. And then afterwards, um, I'll stay on for a few minutes and present some stuff that's coming up on turning. And that probably won't make it into the public recording. And it'll just be special content for uh, the dedicated users who have joined us today. And that'll let me be a little bit more open about what's going on. So uh, we can, we can kind of wrap up the webinar and then stick around for a few minutes 
uh, for a bit that won't get published on YouTube later, um, but we can look at what's coming and turning in the near future. I love that idea, Al. So let's do that now. So I'm going to stop now since it is at the top.